Rally mode. Hello, hello. Thank you guys for joining us today for the Appraiser Red Flags webinar. I'm Chris Sanker. I'm a member with the Realtor Lender Committee. And also Greg Amberby. He's our appraiser today, and he's going to be hosting our webinar today. Uh, if you guys have questions, um, you can either put them in the in the uh, chat box to the right, or you can text them to us. Uh, that that seems to work out pretty good. If you want to text your questions to us, uh, maybe go with Chris first, and he can ask the questions, and then we'll we'll go ahead. Uh, I'm Greg Amberge. Uh, I've been a, a certified real estate appraiser uh, in Ohio and Kentucky for several years now, um, and uh, we have a very specific um, group of definitions that we have to work with. That that and the first, I want to go over a couple of those first and get some of the minutia of appraising out of the way so you understand our perspective. Uh, but first, what is an appraisal? It's basically just an opinion of value. Um, but then the question comes in, what is value? And um, we, we use, uh, I'm sorry, just a moment. Um, we, when, a, when we're appraising, um, we have a client and an intended user of our appraisal report. The client and the intended user are always in a, in a lending transaction, they're always just the lender uh, for typical mortgage purposes. Uh, the client hires us, they engage us to do the assignment. So uh, you, it's important for realtors to understand that they are not the client. The buyer, the seller, uh, the realtor, the loan officer, etc., they are not the client. The actual lender is the client. So we're going to talk about later how to abut an appraisal, and you have to go through the right channels. You can't just go directly to the appraiser and, and uh, talk to them because they're not the client. Um, because you're not the client. Our obligations as appraisers, um, we have uh, a confidentiality, um, some very specific confidentiality rules where we're not supposed to discuss the appraisal report with anyone but the client. Now, now I've underlined the word report because in, a, in the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, we differentiate between the appraisal process and the appraisal report. Once that report goes to the client, um, then, then anything that any communication has to go back through the client who's the lender. We are advocates. Uh, you know, I'm not an advocate for your sale, or I'm not an advocate for the lender or the buyer or the seller. I'm an advocate for my value, uh, my opinion of value. Um, and I have to follow the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice which we're going to go over a few of those rules and why um, we uh, do things the way we do them. But basically, USPAP, as we call it, says the appraiser has to be competent. They have to know what, <coughs> what they're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. They have to know their, their market, and they have to be ethical. So if you are competent and ethical, you're basically going to follow the uniform standards uh, because those, those just uh, outline what's expected of an appraiser as far as knowing their their market and how to how to behave and uh, work ethically. Um, when uh, we had the real estate crisis, the downturn recently, some some new rules were put into place mainly with Dodd-Frank and they they um, created the appraisal independence requirements and so they said Basically, no entity with a direct financial interest in the transaction. Well, that would include a loan officer, uh, a real estate agent, um, a buyer, a seller. Uh, anybody that's, that has a financial interest in this transaction is not to influence or attempt to influence the development, reporting, result or review of an appraisal through coercion, extortion, collusion, compensation, inducement, intimidation, bribery, or any other manner. Um, we have, when we talked about an opinion of value, um, we have a very specific definition of value. And, and I don't think most uh, people in the real estate industry understand, unless you're an appraiser, that, that we have to use this definition of value when we're coming up with an appraisal. It's the most probable price which a property should bring in a competitive and open market 
under all conditions requisite to a fair sale. The buyer and seller, each acting prudently, knowledgeably, and assuming the price is not affected by undue stimulus. Uh, undue stimulus might be you have a buyer who says, uh, I'm in town today, I have to buy a house today because I'm getting transferred here and I've, I can only see three houses and I'm going to buy one of those three. They're, they're under undue stimulus and you might not have a market value sale because they're under pressure to, uh, to get something done. Um, here are the elements of market value. It's the most probable price in a competitive and open market. There's no undue stimulus. The buyer and the seller are typically motivated, and we're going to get into that later, about typical buyers and typical sellers. Um, the buyer and seller are informed, and in, in my opinion, this is the real estate agent's most important job, is to inform their buyer or the seller so that, that the buyer and seller can act in their own best interest in an arm's length transaction. You have, um, well, we'll go over that in a minute, but the property in, in elements of market value, the property is exposed to the market for a reasonable period of time, and the sale is in, in U.S. dollars without unusual concessions. You can have some concessions, but if they're, if they're not, uh, if they're uh, extraordinary for the market, then they'll have to be, adult, have to be dealt with. Here, as a, as a real estate agent, your job, if, you have, if you're working with a buyer, is to make them aware of available competitive listings so they know what's out there. They know, I can go, you know, over the next block over and find that house out over there that's very similar, and maybe they're asking $5,000 less. So that buyer is aware of what's out there. They know the sale and listing history of the property. They know, you know, if, if it's been on the market for two years, there's probably something wrong. Um, the, the informed buyer knows um, the neighborhood dynamics. Um, school district is very important in Ohio. Uh, it's, that's not nearly a, a factor in Kentucky as it is in Ohio. Uh, they're aware of homeowners association fees, deed restrictions, all those kinds of things. And the informed buyer is going to, you're going to show them the property disclosures so they know uh, if there's anything wrong with the place or it's been repaired, uh, if there's a warranty on the foundation that was fixed. And then they're aware of the current market trends. Now, if you are working with a seller and you've got a listing, the seller, in order to come to a reasonable price, that they should be aware of the competitive listings in the, in the neighborhood. They're aware of recent sales. Um, and they're also aware of, of what was listed and didn't sell. Um, expired or canceled listings. They're um, brought up to date on, on market trends and um, they understand the importance of exposure time. Uh, exposure time has become a, a much more important part of the appraisal process in the last couple of years. We now have to address it in every appraisal for lending applications. Like what is a, what was a reasonable exposure time uh, in order for the, for the seller to uh, get market value for their house. An important question that I get asked all the time is, is a real estate agent allowed to talk to an appraiser? Um, and, and again, we're going to differentiate between the appraisal process and the reporting process. During the appraisal process, when I'm gathering information about this house, the answer is, is yes, of course you're allowed to talk to me. Now we have, you may have a uh, an, an appraisal management company or a lender that wants to go above and beyond Dodd-Frank and say, um, we don't want you talking to the listing agent. I find that to be ridiculous. You may have an appraiser who, who's contractually obligated to, to follow that, but uh, for most lenders that I've dealt with, um, as long as you're not trying to influence my appraised value, um, you're certainly allowed to talk to me. In fact, I, I want to get more information about the house so that my appraisal is, is more accurate. Now, after I submit my appraisal report to my client, then yeah, if you happen to get a copy of it and you're not happy with it, you can't just call me up and ask me to change it or, you know, or uh, read me the riot act. You have to go back through the lender, and most of them have a process for uh, – submitting a, a rebuttal, and we'll talk about that later. You may convey, convey facts to the appraiser about the subject property or other listings in the neighborhood. 
I still have to verify all this information, but if you want to give me information, for instance, recently uh, I called uh, an agent to uh, schedule an appointment, and she said, uh, I just wanted to tell you that there's a house like four doors down that's very similar to our house, and she said it had a kitchen that was you know, original to the house. The kitchen was 45 years old. And that was the real difference. This house that I was appraising was selling for about $5,000 more. Well, that's information that I probably would have missed if I was just going through and looking at the MLS sheets because I don't think anybody's going to advertise that their house had the original kitchen. So she got information to me that I went back and looked at the interior photos, and sure enough, that house had the original kitchen from like 1965. And um, that was the difference. I made an adjustment in the sales grid and and that turned out to be the best comp I had because it was four doors down and it was uh, with with the adjusted indicated value supported the sale price. Um, you can give me facts like that. I have to verify them but what you're not able to do is is to attempt to influence the outcome of the appraisal by telling the appraiser how they have to interpret those facts because that's going to go to his opinion. For instance, you could say, um, this is the biggest lot in the whole subdivision. It's almost three-quarters of an acre. What you can't say is, because this is the biggest lot in the subdivision, you have to add $5,000 to the appraised value. Um, it's just the difference between providing facts that are verifiable and uh, trying to influence my opinion or the opinion of the appraiser. Here's information we need that, that can only probably come from you. This is the most important one right now because we're starting to see for the first time in years uh, multiple offers. If the house went into multiple offers and especially if, this, if the sale price is higher than the list price, we have to explain that to a lender. So if the thing went into multiple offers, the appraiser absolutely needs that information. Um, if there are multiple parcels, say the house is on one parcel that's three quarters of an acre, but there's a half acre parcel behind that, we may not look for it unless somebody lets us know it's there. Um, if there are, we have to put in every appraisal the approximate dates of any updates or remodeling, especially to kitchens and bathrooms. So uh, we need to get that information. Um, if this transaction is not an arm's length transaction, it's a it's a transaction between family members or friends, or for some reason it's just not a, a, an arm's length transaction. We need to know because sometimes you might have a family member selling a house and, and their, their nephew finds out you know, his uncle's house is for sale. And so the uncle's taking less than market value for it. Uh, let us know that. Um, if the thing's a short sale or a relocation sale, I'm sure that's going to be in your MLS sheet, but that's information we need. If the seller was urgent to sell the house and purposefully priced it below market value, let us know why. Uh, because lenders look at our appraisal, and if things are out of whack or not quite right, they want to know. They want us to explain everything that's an abnormality about this sale. Um, if the thing, if the seller is an executor of an estate, um, any of that information, or like I said earlier, if there's, if you have information about other sales and listings in the neighborhood. Um, the listing agent is probably um, the best source, the listing agent or the seller, because they might know the neighbors. They've been in that house. If there's information that we can verify about uh, another house in the neighborhood, by all means, get that to us. Now, um, my experience, uh, when, when I usually see um, houses where the appraisal comes in, drastically different, the appraised value comes in drastically different from the sale price. Um, one of the things, one of the places I see that a lot is in for sale by owner houses where a guy may, he may price his house based on how much he owes on the mortgage and uh, somebody may come along and fall in love with it and they're not an informed buyer and they either pay way less than market value or way more. Sometimes you'll see this in single agent sales where you have uh, somebody list a price, maybe they list it kind of high, and then they get a buyer who comes in first day, falls in love with it, buys it, and 
and that hasn't really had another set of eyes looking at it. Um, if, if sellers are, are uh, very nervous or combative right off the bat, it kind of it kind of sets off our uh, antenna that something may be wrong here. If, if, um, if a seller follows us all over the house on the appraisal and tries to talk to us, a lot of times I find out it's because there's something they don't want us to see and they're trying to find out if I see it. Uh, maybe there's a problem with the foundation. They're going to follow me down in the basement and, and see if I take a picture of it. Um, tell, tell your sellers to leave us alone and let us do our jobs. <laughs> We're all we're all very highly uh, vetted as appraisers. We've we've gone through a, a, a lot, and none of us have criminal records. We're not thieves, and we're licensed by the state. So let us do our jobs. If the sale price is higher than the list price, again we have to <clears throat> excuse me we have to explain that to the lender. Um, and and right now the market is so hot that we're seeing that more and more because we're we're seeing um, multiple offers and and. And uh, you'll see it especially in lender-owned properties where they set a list price at what the appraisal came in at, and then people are bidding online. And sometimes those will be uh, 20, 30, 40 percent more than the list price because um, uh, the, early, the first appraisal came in low, and that's where they set the list price. Uh, we just have to explain all that. Um, I, I don't normally like... Um, Realtors supplying me with comparable sales. Uh, I, my friend uh, Chris in the lender committee yesterday was telling me what he does is that he he gives an appraiser a copy of uh, some MLS printouts and says these are the sales and listings that the buyer and seller were looking at when they came up with the um, with the sale price. That that's a good way to present that. <clears throat> The most important part of what we do as appraisers is comparable selection. Uh, so we don't uh, really want someone else doing that job for us. Uh, some appraisers don't mind. I don't mind, but I don't usually, I don't usually put a lot of uh, credence in what somebody hands me. I want to look at the market myself, and I want to see what's out there that uh, on the high end and the low end, and compare them all. If a house went pending. And then, and then something happened and the sale didn't go through and it went back on the market, be prepared to tell the, the realtor what happened. Either the financing fell through or there was a, a defect with the property, uh, something like that. Uh, now, when the value opinion or the appraised value comes in lower than the sale price, and I'm sure that's why a lot of you are listening in today, um, you need to uh, be prepared to make your case. There's a few things you might want to understand. A uh, very wise man, Stephen Covey, said in the Seven Habits of Highly Ex Effective People, he said, uh, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So it's important that you understand the appraiser's perspective before you, you try to make your case. It's important that you read the whole appraisal, not just that final value. And there are comments all throughout the appraisal, and especially on page three of the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report, there's a whole section of comments that uh, may explain um, and should explain the appraiser's logic and his, his reconciling of uh, all the factors in the appraisal. Read those and get to know what, what the appraiser was thinking. This is very important. We've talked about this in our committee meeting. We have different perspectives. As realtors, you guys are trying to look at the market and figure out what, what's going to happen in a month or two months or three months. Where's this sale price? Where should I price this thing so that it's going to sell? As appraisers, our charge is to put most of our, our um, credence in closed sales. So we're looking backwards. And a lot of times when there's a big market shift, you guys see it before we see it because we're we're myopically looking in the rearview mirror to see what actually happened. Um, and for, for instance, when when the downturn started, I hadn't seen it yet as an appraiser. And and there was a, a realtor I saw at a basketball game, and he I said, How, "How's it looking out there?" And he said, "Man, it's brutal." He said, "I got I got 20 listings and like no buyers." I said, "Really?" 
Well, it turns out in, in two months, we started seeing the same thing, an oversupply of housing. But the realtor saw it first. So remember that the appraiser is looking backwards, and um, so he may not be seeing the same things that you're seeing. Uh, does your sale meet those requirements that we went over earlier of a market sale where you've got informed buyers and informed sellers, there's no undue stimulus, um, and then you can have an unbiased th third party look it over. It's probably better to have maybe your real estate broker or someone look it over um, because an appraiser, if I, if I give an opinion of value, even if it's just uh, a short one, I'm under an obligation to follow the whole uniform standards of appraisal practice and they really don't want us, I, I get asked all the time, hey, what do you think my house is worth? I just can't answer because the rules prohibit me from doing that. So it, be, it might be good to have your, have your broker or somebody look it over and see if they see uh, any kind of flaws in the appraisal. If you are satisfied that you're your sale price is market value and the appraisal came in low and you want to do a rebuttal. The, here's the important things to remember. Um, this this uh, rebuttal has to be submitted through back around through the lender who is, who is the appraiser's client. You can't just call the appraiser and say, hey, you missed this comparable sale. Um, why didn't you use this? It, it, you can prepare a rebuttal and send it back through. Most, most lenders have some sort of a process where you can submit a rebuttal and then they, re, they will require the, the appraiser to consider those new facts. Um, don't make any personal attacks um, as bad as you may want to. Uh, keep, keep your uh, appraisal rebuttal, rebuttal factual. Um, again, you're not allowed to, to influence and say how we're supposed to interpret those facts, but if you have facts that the appraiser missed, um, we want to get it right. I don't, I don't know any appraisers who take any joy in, in killing someone's real estate deal. Um, we want to get it right. Now, emphasize uh, recent comparables, very recent ones, and pendings. Um, I had a, an appraisal once where I, uh, it's when the new Horseshoe Casino opened up downtown and um, there was an explosion in demand for condos downtown. It's still going on. And I was looking back, you know, three to six months for comparable sales and I submitted my report and a, and a very thoughtful realtor put together a really nice rebuttal, sent it to the lender and there were three sales that were pending on my effective date. So I didn't see them as closed sales. They closed the week after and they were the best comparables for, for my condo. So I said, to, I, the lender sent me this and I said, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, go by and see the house, see the condo again and put a new effective date on it, on this report, because these are better comparables than the one I was using. And I changed my uh, appraised value. Uh, but again, the lender, that has to go back through the lender and the lender has to be open to uh, some sort of a revision like that. You might look for comps that are between 6 and 18 months old because most of our lenders are requiring us to really pay attention to the last 6 months. But if you're in March and you know, you've just come through the winter months, there may not be a lot of sales. There may be some great ones from last summer or from you know, last spring that support your sale price and, and are very indicative of what's going on in the neighborhood that the appraiser maybe just missed. Um, some, some appraisal management companies, or AMCs as we call them, um, really put a lot of pressure on appraisers to use sales even from the last three months. Well again, if you're in March or April, there aren't going to be a lot of sales from the last three months. But if those sales were sort of low, that may be why the appraised value came in low because they're getting pressure from a from a client. Again, that's a vet, that's a violation of the Dodd Frank rules because the client or the appraisal management company is not supposed to influence our value either, but they do, and it's uh, something we're fighting as a group um, as appraisers. Uh, again, in your in your appraisal rebuttal, be as detached and as logical as possible. Um, Again, submit the rebuttal to the client. Uh, 
for the appraiser's consideration. Be, be respectful. Um, I've, I've seen just some of the nastiest comments ever come back from realtors whose, whose deal fell down, fell through. Um, that really had nothing to do with the appraisal. They had nothing to do with, uh, with anything except they were mad and they let it show. Just be professional. And don't nitpick over items that have no effect on the value. Um, an appraisal sometimes is 20 pages long. Generally, there's a typographical error in there somewhere. There's a misspelled word. There's, you know, something's wrong. Little, little things that have no effect on the value. There's something wrong with almost every appraisal. We're all human. Uh, don't nitpick pick over those things because they have nothing to do with the value. Um, if, you have, if I use the comparable and you have information about that that is pertinent to me that I didn't know and I didn't make an adjustment for, let me know through the lender and I can go back and try to verify that independently from another source. And for instance, if you had a house where there was a uh, gruesome murder that took place, well, I didn't know that. And um, everybody in the neighborhood knew it and they had to disclose it in the disclosure forms. But I didn't catch it and, it, and that house sold for 15% less than the typical house in the neighborhood, and I just thought it was a normal comp. Uh, if you have information like that or anything about maybe you know that house had a bad foundation, um, then get that information to the appraiser and say, you need to make an adjustment on comparable number two be, because here's some information you didn't have. And don't, don't make threats about you know, going to the state or anything. Um, this really never works out. <laughs> well <laughs> in the realtor's favor um, sometimes you'll have appraisals that are that are just bad I, I've seen a few um, you'll have geographic incompetence you've got an appraiser from outside the Southwest Ohio market who uh, maybe he doesn't even have the Cincinnati MLS and he's coming in it's legal technically for him to do an appraisal in the state of Ohio, but he doesn't have, but it, it, it's a violation of use PAP because he, he doesn't have what we call geographic competence. Uh, so look, look for, look, see where the appraiser's from. Is he from the area? Does he know the market? If there are blatant factual errors um, and, and you can prove those by you're within your rights to question the outcome of the, of the appraisal um, every now and then, because we're human, I'll be adjusting a comparable and I'll mean, I'll mean to add $5,000 to it and I subtract $5,000 from it. Um, it happens. Generally, our software is set up to, to catch those things before we send them in, but every now and then you'll see a wrong way adjustment that affects the outcome of the appraisal. Um, if your adjustments are not based on market reactions, uh, that's a more difficult one and you'll probably have to hire uh, a very competent appraiser and engage them um, to uh, to talk about that, but uh, that happens sometimes. And then if you've got uh, violations of the uniform standards of uh, appraisal practice, um, that's a that's a huge deal for us. That's how we get in trouble is violating uh, USPAP. So let's answer your questions. You can you can text those to us or um, uh, Send them, uh, send them in uh, on the uh, uh, on the chat chat Same. box. Did you have anything? No, I didn't have anything. Okay, um, let's talk. Yesterday, I had a, a a realtor in the lender committee ask me a question about a house that was uh, um, it had it was a two story house with a second floor kitchen, and they were doing a VA appraisal. Now, the one thing you need to understand about VA appraisers, they are the most protected group of appraisers out there. VA backs their appraisers 100%. It's very hard to get on that list. You have to really know what you're doing, and those guys are pretty good. So this VA appraiser said, wow, this house is strange. It's, it's a two-story house. It's got a kitchen on the second floor. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen that in all the years I've been doing this. So this realtor friend of mine sold the house. The VA appraiser comes in and says, well, this is an abnormality. And, and he um, you know, brought it up in the appraisal, made, made adjustments for it, for, for its functional utility. 
and uh, the deal kind of fell through. Um, if you have, and, and he was asking me, he said this buyer liked this house because it had a it had a second floor kitchen, and he wanted a second floor kitchen. And I said, well, here's the problem: your buyer is not a typical buyer. Your buyer had some reason for wanting that that 99.99 percent of buyers would find to be an abnormality. So here again, we're dealing with market value. What does a typical buyer say about that in-ground pool or that second floor kitchen or that um, the man cave built over the garage? One of my favorite things. I, uh, I'm seeing some awesome, uh, you know, uh, poker rooms built in the uh, attic portion of a garage now. Uh, to me, that's a, that's a great feature. Uh, but it, what's a typical buyer going to say about that? Um, in Ohio, an in-ground pool, I get asked all the time, should I put an in-ground pool in my house? I say only if you're going to enjoy it. And, and if you're planning on getting dollar for dollar for it, um, if you live in Indian Hill, sure, you'll probably get dollar for dollar for it. But if you live in Fairfield or, or somewhere, um, the pool is probably going to cost more than a typical buyer is willing to pay for it at, um, uh, at, at the sale. Okay, we've got some questions coming in here. Did you get anything yet? No, nothing. I'm sorry. Um, uh, someone wants to know about um, homeowners associations and their and their effect on um, on value. Um, I th I think um, there's a there's generally a, a subset of people that don't want to live in a neighborhood with a homeowners association. Um, I uh, had a typically some of my neighbors had a typically bad experience in a neighborhood I used to live in. Uh, generally, I don't find that it's that it's uh, that big of a difference. Um, again, there are there are subsets of buyers that want different things in a house, and you'll have people that that just definitely don't want to live in a neighborhood with an HOA. Um, but uh, and, and it's easy for them. You can go on in the MLS and and um, uh, get that out. But it's not something we normally. Uh, you know, subtract for or, or add for or anything like that. Chris, did you have any questions? Nope, I didn't get any questions to come through. So, <laughs> okay, well, um, just remember, we'll, we'll recap that um, uh, it's very important to understand that the appraiser is working with um, the, that def that definite definition of. Uh, market value, which is in every appraisal, it's in our certification, that the appraisal has to be a typical informed buyer and a typical informed seller coming together in an arm's length transaction. They're they're typically motivated. They're acting in their own best interest, and um, uh, that's a lot of times where you've got that unusual house. Uh, maybe it's the biggest house in the neighborhood. Maybe it's the smallest house in the neighborhood. And it's it's difficult to um, you know every every neighborhood has a best house, and when that one's for sale, um, it's going to bring more than everything else in the neighborhood. And so it, maybe it's the biggest house, maybe it's the one that's been over updated. Uh, they just completely uh, they put they're they're in a hundred thousand dollar neighborhood, and they put marble countertops and hardwood floors and 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 uh, they've they've over improved this house for what it's going to bring in the neighborhood. Those are things that the appraiser has to consider. Um, realtors are always saying that the most important thing in a house is location, location, location. Until they've got the nicest house in the neighborhood, and then they want you to go two miles away and to find comparables. Um, it's very difficult when you have the nicest house in the neighborhood. Um, uh, or the biggest house, or something like that. Now, if it's the um, uh, uh, lenders like conformity, they like um, 
they like to see my appraisal when they look at the map. They, they figure I can stand on the driveway and throw a rock and hit my three comps. Um, and they all sold in the last six months, and they're all built by the same builder in the same year with the same bedroom count and bathroom count. And, and that, that kind of appraisal is just going to breeze through underwriting. What, where, you, where you start to have problems is when you're out in the country or you have, uh, like Chris was telling me, you have a 100-year-old farmhouse that they sold the land and built a subdivision around it, and it's not like anything else in the neighborhood. Um, there's a, a, a beautiful one up in Mainville by where I used to live uh, with a, this a phenomenal old uh, farmhouse, and, and they built a subdivision around it. When you go to appraise that farmhouse, it's, it's going to be a different animal than anything else in the neighborhood, um, and it's, it's a difficult job for the appraiser. Well, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Did you have anything else? Greg, I do have one question. How okay. do appraisers usually just for over-the-top or abnormal additions to homes? Um, I almost always, that's a good question. I get asked that a lot. I almost always advise people, don't build onto your house unless you're planning on living there the rest of your life and it's just something you, you really want to do, you like the neighborhood and you, you want to enjoy it. it. If you build onto a house in a subdivision and suddenly your house becomes the strange one, everybody else has two bathrooms and you've got three, everybody else has three bedrooms and you have four, it's going to be very difficult for you to get money out of that when it comes to, uh, to sale time. Sell your house and buy a new one. Buy one that has that, that thing you need. It's, it's, uh, now, remodeling your house is a different story, but putting an addition on, unless you're out in the country where um, you know, if you're not in a subdivision, then it's not a problem uh, because we're able to go out miles for comparables and find something similar. Um, the, okay, we had a question. Somebody asked, why is the buyer living in the property a red flag? Well, generally, it, it's, we're saying that uh, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we have to, we have to understand why. Is this, is this a, a lease-to-own thing where maybe the contract was signed three years ago, and now the, the person's been leasing the home to own it? Um, it? It sends up a red flag to us that this, this contract was probably signed three years ago at the value of the house three years ago. So maybe it's going to come in low because prices have bumped up a little bit. Or um, maybe there was, uh, you know, it, or maybe it's a, a relative living in the house. Again, it just, it just sends a message to us that this is not an arm's length transaction probably. Uh, I got another question here. Um, How do you come to the value of a short sale? This is a, a very difficult uh, question because a short sale is generally going to sell um, for below market value because a typical buyer doesn't want to wait months for the lender to come back with an answer. They want to find a house that, that um, you know, they can move into at closing probably in less than a month. And so a short sale is, uh, it's a different animal, and they're almost always sold at, at below market value somewhere because it's not, the house isn't just ready to go and ready to close. Um, how you come up with the value on that is uh, different for every neighborhood. A short sale in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an upscale neighborhood um, is going to be a different animal than a than a, a short sale in a neighborhood of seventy five thousand dollar homes, um, and uh, it it all depends. A lot of it just depends on is there demand? Are there buyers out there that are willing to wait three months to close? Um, they're they're a, a subset of typical buyers. They're not typical buyers, and the seller is not a typical seller. So the the price that they come up come to is not. Uh, is almost surely not going to be market value. Uh, how you determine that is a is a uh, a very involved process. Uh, here's here's a here's a question. Um, what is the penalty to a realtor if they try to influence 
um, your value. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, the state licensing board would do um, with appraisers. Um, we have a we have a a hotline to report such things to the state. Um, I don't I don't normally it would have to be an extreme case I think before something would get reported to the state. But I don't know what the penalties are. I'm sure it's uh, probably some added continuing education, maybe a short suspension, but I'm just guessing there. I don't really know. Uh, did you have another question? No questions here. Uh, okay, here's one. The closest comparable is four to five miles away. How far of a radius from a subject property is reasonable? That's a great question. Um, and it depends where you are. If you're in a subdivision in Fairfield or Mason or Redding, um, in general, you shouldn't need to go outside the neighborhood unless there just haven't been any sales in the last six months. If you're out in the country, um, by all means, if it's a rural area, we can go as far as we need to go. Uh, sometimes you'll have a property with you know five acres, and I've got to find other comparables with a similar acreage and and all that, and it's gonna, it's, I'm going to have to go out a ways. Um, uh, if you have that unusual house, for instance, uh, up in, in uh, you can take an area like Price Hill, where the houses, there's a section of houses up on top of the hill that you can look down the Ohio River Valley about 10 miles, and you see the skyline of Cincinnati, and the view is just breathtaking. But there aren't that many of them up there. And so you may have to, in order to um, to comp for that view, you might have to go into a totally different uh, neighborhood miles away um, and then adjust for location. Um, so in general, the, the lender likes it when you don't go uh, as far, but sometimes I'll have, I've had, uh, instances where I had three comparable sales in a subdivision and I went five miles away to find sale number four because there was something weird about this house that I had to address in the in the report. So I went five miles away and found another house that had the same thing or I went three years back in time and found one, which is an unusual um, thing to do in an appraisal. But when, you, when you've got that weird house that's got that one weird feature, uh, in general, the, the lender likes you to have at least one comparable sale that has that similar feature. Okay, you said that lenders like conformity. How do you value a 30-year-old home in a neighborhood of 60 to 90-year-old homes? That's a great question. You see this a lot um, right now in uh, Oakley. They're building brand new houses. Uh, sometimes you'll have, uh, there were some, you know, some vacant lots or one little area they'll build a street of three or four houses on. Um, in general, uh, a new house or a, let's say a 30-year-old house compared to a 90-year-old house, we, we make adjustments in that sales comparison grid for age. Um, and, it, and it has to be based on how is the market reacting to the difference between a 30-year-old house and a 90-year-old house? Sometimes you can look at 10 different sales and four of them were 30 years old and six of them were 90 years old and there doesn't seem to be any market reaction at all. You'll see this a lot in, in uh, where you have a historic district where um, the historic homes like uh, up in Lebanon um, People actually would rather have the older house than the newer one because they, they, they're just into old ha homes. So we're trying to judge. There's no, set, there's no set formula for how to do that. If you've got a 30-year-old house in a 90-year-old neighborhood, um, generally the lender is going to want me to try to find another house of the same circa. But I'm going to also use stuff from the neighborhood because the location is a very powerful indicator. Um, again, if you're going to build a new house in an old neighborhood, don't, um, in general, my, my advice would be don't build a house that's going to outstrip the neighborhood as far as price goes. People do it all the time, but it's, it's, not, a good, it's not a good idea. 
Um, again, on the on the subject of conformity, uh, uh, in order for me to find, let's say I'm in uh, Claremont County, out in the country, and I have a um, a house that has uh, five acres that's fenced for horses, and they've got a nice little metal pole barn. Um, the lender is going to want to see my appraisal. Uh, prefer they don't need houses because I'm I'm out in the country like that in a rural environment. They don't need me to to have three houses within a mile. They need me to have three houses. I like to say with stay within the same school district if possible, but they want to see you know acreage. They want to see a similar pole barn. Um, in in what uh, in uh, New York they might call a gentleman's farm. Just in, just in a, a small little area where it's, and there's no agricultural activity, but there's a uh, you know there's a fence for horses. Um, so uh, so conformity changes when you're in a rural environment. Conformity um, it, it has a, takes on a whole different character. Um, but generally, uh, what what lenders like to see is me stay in the same subdivision. They love those you know, platted subdivisions by one of the developers in town. And I've got all the comps that are, that are similar. Um, that doesn't always happen. And let me, let me address the subject real quickly of appraisal management companies. Um, we, I don't know any appraiser, uh, and I know a lot, I don't know one appraiser that is fond of the, of the concept of appraisal management companies. Um, they are sort of a middleman between the lender and the appraiser. And um, they sometimes will put um, restrictions on us that Fannie Mae don't requ doesn't require, that FHA doesn't require, and they will try to get us to do appraisals that meet requirements that underwriting doesn't even need. And so you'll have an appraiser who's receiving pressure from an AMC to only use comps within a quarter mile, say, or only use comps from within the last three months. This really can, screw, can uh, skew your value um, if, if the appraiser doesn't have the autonomy, autonomy to make a decision about what are the most relevant comps for this appraisal. Um, there's, a, there's a huge backlash going on right now with all the appraiser organizations against appraisal management companies. I stopped working with them about two years ago. I was working with about 10, and I just uh, took my name off all their lists. And I work with lenders who use a rotating um, computer-driven uh, assignment procedure uh, that meets all the requirements of Dodd-Frank and all the appraiser independence requirements. They, they may have 10 appraisers in the Cincinnati area, and their computer has an algorithm that says, well, I, this... This, this is only three miles from Greg Amberg's house. I'm going to send this one to him. Or, uh, you know, it looks like uh, Greg could get this done in two days, so I'm going to send this appraisal to him. The computer does it. It meets all the Dodd-Frank requirements, and, it, and it, it allows us to have direct contact with the lender if we need to, who is our client. Um, and we've also uh, seen... The price of appraisals go up, but the amount of money that actually goes to the appraiser go way down because the appraisal management companies have overhead and they have expenses and they have to make money. They're for profit organizations. So, um, if I was if I was looking for a lender, one of the more important questions I would ask is, how does your company procure appraisals? Do you go through appraisal management companies and and end up charging me? Uh, an exorbitant amount of money for an appraisal, or does your does your computer system do it? And and uh, so that way, if I have a question for the underwriter, I can just call and ask them. If they have a question for me, they can just call and ask me. It speeds up the process. If you have an appraisal management company, everything has to go through them. I'm not allowed to talk to the lender. And that was an overreaction to Dodd Frank, the the whole appraisal management company phenomenon. Now, this is my opinion. It's not the opinion of the Board of Realtors, it's my opinion, that that uh, it was an overreaction to Dodd-Frank, and it was not necessary, and as long as you set up a system whereby the, the loan officer is not picking the appraiser, everything is, uh, is up, is, uh, 
as it should be. All right. Anything new? I think we're I think we're finished. Um, we appreciate you guys coming today. We're again we're here on behalf of the Realtor Lender Committee. We're trying to provide information to everybody. Uh, we have a great group of people from uh, title title people, title lawyers, uh, lenders, uh, all kind and a lot of realtors where we discuss issues uh, leading up to the the. Uh, the acceptance of a contract all the way to the closing. So we'll be providing more of these uh, as time goes on. And um, uh, you can uh, tune in every month. I believe the second Wednesday most of the time at noon we'll be having uh, some sort of a lunch and learn. And I'm sure uh, next month will be very informative. Well, thank you for your attendance today. We appreciate it. And uh, we're off. <laughs>